There is a toxic herbicide called glyphosate, which is used in practically all weed killers all over the world. Monsanto, the North American giant agrochemical company, was the first to start selling it in 1974. Since then, sales have exploded, and now companies all over the world are making glyphosate products. It is a multi-billion dollar market worth about 8 billion euros per year. However, there is growing information coming out about the negative effects of glyphosate on the ecosystem, on plants, on insects, mammals, and other animals, including on human health. In response, a global campaign organized a mock court trial called the Monsanto Tribunal, which gathered five judges and dozens of witnesses from all over the world. Witnesses from Latin America showed how children and families living near glyphosate spraying areas developed diseases, birth defects, and genetic disorders. For plants, glyphosate can apparently lead to more diseases, such as the sudden death syndrome fungus and to new superweeds. For animals, scientists claim glyphosate is linked to malformations like extra limbs, to an increase in infectious diseases, or to more stillborn animals. In the USA, thousands of farmers have taken Monsanto to court, accusing their products of causing them to develop cancer. But Monsanto has always said glyphosate was as safe as salt. What we represent, our clients are individuals who have used Roundup either uh, through agricultural work as farm workers, house gardeners, or employed as gardeners, or anybody that uses Roundup, all of whom who have developed non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, a specific type of cancer. But we have a prog about 10,000 plaintiffs, individual people, uh, currently, and we are getting hundreds every week, all over the country. It is thanks to these farmers and their families that we now have growing evidence about glyphosate. This evidence was found in internal Monsanto documents and emails which were released to the US court and then slowly made public during 2017. The company Monsanto has known since 1985. Roundup was originally uh, categorized by the Environmental Protection Agency as a category C, meaning possible carcinogen. And unfortunately, what, we, what one would hope a company would do when they become aware of that is investigate and do more testing. Instead, what Monsanto chose to do is to attack the science, and they've been doing that for the last 30 years to try and, and prevent people from knowing instead of doing what we would hope a company would do, which is investigate. Wow, if you find out that there is uh, potential for your product to cause this horrible type of cancer, investigate, do more testing instead of trying to cover up. The Monsanto papers have shown us very clearly what Monsanto is doing around the world to get regulators, to get governments, to greenlight the sales of their products, independently of the risks associated with these products, and in particular, Roundup, the glyphosate-based herbicide that they sell. To sell products like herbicides, they must be approved by regulators. This means their safety must be reviewed by independent bodies. The World Health Organization's Independent Cancer Research Agency, called IARC, decided to reevaluate the safety of glyphosate. So Monsanto's people came up with a plan. The idea was to cast doubt upon any regulator or scientist who would dare to question the safety of their products. And we have thousands of documents. We also, of course, have the documents that have come out through the litigation now. So pieces of the puzzle are starting to fall into place. And some of that, um, some of those documents show pretty clearly Monsanto anticipated that IARC would find glyphosate to be possibly or probably carcinogenic. They knew this, they anticipated this, they talk in their internal documents about being vulnerable with the science, epidemiology, toxicology, mode of action, others. They express worry and fear months before IARC even sat down to meet. They talk about how they need to get money, they need to fight this. They put together a preparedness document um, with very strategic ways to orchestrate an outcry, to create outrage. So they, they knew what the science said, they knew what IARC would find, and they very carefully and craftily came up with a plan to try to discredit IARC. Again, all of it before IARC even met. You do obviously have, you see in the documents and you know throughout history, um, that you have very close ties, at least in the Environmental Protection Agency, 
in the U.S. with large corporate chemical companies. Um, the documents show that Monsanto had particular influence and sway over a number of top EPA officials. There were also people within EPA, toxicologists and other scientists, who tried to raise alarm bells and who found problems in the research with glyphosate, in Monsanto's own research. Uh, they found um, evidence that glyphosate caused cancer. But the political pressure and the power from the top, you know, has, has combined to have the EPA essentially doing Monsanto's bidding. But despite this, in March 2015, IARC concluded that Monsanto's cash cow glyphosate was probably carcinogenic for humans and that there was sufficient evidence of carcinogenicity in animals. To make things worse for Monsanto, at the end of 2017, the market license to sell glyphosate in the European Union was going to expire. If glyphosate was not reapproved, those companies would lose out on over 500 million potential EU customers, a market worth $1 billion. Monsanto and its competitors could not risk a negative assessment by the EU. They really needed the EU to approve glyphosate for sale on the market, so they created the Glyphosate Task Force. GTF is a coalition of over 20 companies that have joined resources to make sure glyphosate is approved for sale in the EU. It is led by Monsanto. In spring 2017, they threatened the European Commission if it would not reauthorize the weed killer by the end of the year. In the EU, when a product is being authorized, one country takes the lead and its national authorities review the scientific studies on that product. In the case of glyphosate, the German Federal Institute of Risk Assessment, BFR, was in charge of the initial assessment. Their role was to check the available science and then make an initial proposal to the EU on whether or not to reauthorize glyphosate. The problem is that the German BFR has been accused of copying and pasting information directly from the GTF companies that have a specific interest in getting their glyphosate products approved. We've seen that major parts, very important parts of the EU assessment of glyphosate have been copy-pasted straight from Monsanto. Now, we cannot call this an independent assessment any longer. NGOs, scientists and politicians denounce this plagiarism and accuse the BFR of failing to do its critical job of checking the scientific correctness of all the studies. We considered that the conclusions we saw from the BFR um, EFSA documents were flawed. Scientifically, they used improper procedures, they ignored critical scientific evidence, they ignored the methods by which they should have been evaluating that scientific evidence, and they brought in evidence that was irrelevant to the discussions that they should have, they should have had. I don't know why they did that. All I can say is that is what they've done, and from a scientific perspective, it is flawed. BFR sent its findings to the EU Food Safety Agency, which eventually decided, unlike IARC, that glyphosate was not carcinogenic. We need to ask, is this assessment valid as a basis for a decision on approval of glyphosate for sale in Europe? Our answer is no. This is not an independent assessment and we need to start from scratch. Meanwhile, researchers say Monsanto had been doing everything to put pressure on the scientists that were speaking up about the possible dangers of glyphosate. Hey, remember that million dollar lab we provided your university? Payback time. And you think I'm joking? I'm not joking. It is that direct and that sad. Or they would try to discredit scientists who raised concerns with glyphosate. Seralini, again, as you can see in the documents from Monsanto um, and others, Seralini was a, a victim of a very carefully orchestrated assault by Monsanto. Um, not only did Monsanto criti criticize Seralini's work, but they requested and employed secretly others in the academic world, other scientists from around the world, to criticize Seralini, to call for a retraction. These people looked like they were doing it independently, but they were doing it at the behest of Monsanto. Um, you can see it very clearly in the, in the documents. And again, he is one example, but they have done this to other scientists around the world. Maybe not to the extent that they did it to Seralini. They had their influence. They had people, you know, influence uh, the journal. They had people inside the journal. Um, so, again, you know, their reach is, is pretty deep um, and it's pretty deceptive. 
not only is they are actively fighting independent scientists they are destroying their career look at what they are doing with the international agency for the research against cancer for example which is you know the cornerstone the gold standard in international uh, cancer assessment they are actually actu actually trying to destroy it they have as we speak they have an ongoing campaign to destroy its credibility its reputation uh, they are they are working with us senators to attack its funding they are using third parties to undermine and to even smear the scientists who've been part of the of the work i mean what they do is not science let's be very very clear about this 3300 Monsanto apparently even made fake citizens campaigns to defend glyphosate. They also enlisted a number of partners, um, sort of organizations that appear to be independent of Monsanto, but we know are not independent because of the documents. They enlisted them to write letters to the editor, to um, you know, write policy briefs, to complain about IARC. They enlisted lawmakers to try to get funding stripped from IARC. They attacked the various um, scientists at IARC. They ghost wrote um, articles that would appear to be from independent bloggers or journalists or professors, um, but were actually written by Monsanto employees. Um, you know, it's, there's it many, many different um, tactics that they employed to try to discredit IARC. Monsanto has also been accused of trying to influence journalists to make sure they don't publish stories that would harm their profits. There are very few journalists, I think, who like to take them on. It's not um, an easy road by any means. They come after you. They came after me. They still come after me um, with personal attacks and, and trying to uh, uh, discredit me and others um, and many other journalists as well. Anyone who really tries to tell a story that they don't uh, like. I've covered a lot of corporations. You know, I've been a journalist more than 25 years. I've covered a lot of different industries and, and very powerful companies. I can say definitely Monsanto, um, you know, has a much more aggressive style um, in terms of pressuring journalists. Um, and they also, of course, we've seen try to pressure scientists. Um, they are very assertive and very aggressive in their desire to spin the narrative um, to their own good. They even try to pressure citizens' campaign groups by sending them legal threats and trying to drag them through the courts. To get to the facts behind the glyphosate controversy, four Greens, EFA members of the European Parliament, decided to ask the EU Food Safety Authority for access to the studies. We specifically requested them, using the EU Freedom of Information laws, because the studies have never been made public in full. Unlike the UN Agency for Cancer Research, EFSA's assessment does not oblige the companies to publish their studies in peer-reviewed scientific journals, which means that we can't double-check if the science is correct. But in the EU, this doesn't seem to matter. I accuse the European authorities of committing scientific fraud. This fraudulent approach made it possible for the authorities to reinforce uh, the conclusion originally drawn uh, by the Monsanto-led glyphosate task force, the submitters of the dossier. When we requested from EFSA the studies they had received from Monsanto and its allies, they were denied to us in order to protect the commercial interests of the companies. All that we were allowed to see were the titles of the studies, the contents pages, and the annexes with tables of data in PDF format. Everything else was denied to us, so we took EFSA to court. You can't make proper public decisions unless you have the information in the public domain. I was here yesterday in this anonymous lawyer's office to see the secret studies that were paid for by Monsanto that are supposed to show that glyphosate is safe. This is no way to make decisions. As soon as Monsanto found out about this, they joined the court case too. So did Danish chemical company Cheminova. They basically want to make sure the studies are kept secret by EFSA. The German government also joined the case, but then, after the news came out in the press, they decided to withdraw. The judges in the European Court of Justice will now have to decide whether preventing public access to the scientific studies on glyphosate is justified or not. So what do we do now? We've already seen the power of people's campaigning. When the debate started in the EU, glyphosate was originally going to be renewed for 15 years, but the European Parliament resisted this and called for glyphosate to be phased out after five years. 
and the governments of the EU were also feeling the pressure from the citizens. Although they voted on the prolongation of glyphosate's license three times, they always failed to reach an agreement. And so the European Commission had to take the final decision. And supported by a very small majority of member states, they decided to prolong glyphosate's license, but only for five years. So now we have five years, five years to end this toxic charade. I think, as a journalist, you know, I just want to have the truth be out there. And I think that regulators and members of the public, members of the press, um, need to pay more attention to the truth, to the actual, authentic, independent science. Because the evidence shows us very clearly that the science that regulators have been relying on is not true, it's not authentic, it's manipulated. Determined to uncover the truth, the European Parliament has launched a special inquiry committee to shed some light on the glyphosate controversy. Our members in the Greens' EFA group will push to make sure that difficult questions are asked and that the truth is really revealed. We want to evaluate the whole process works. If independent science is taken into account and not dismissed, we want to evaluate the fact that all data are taken into account, that there is an open and a transparent procedure, and that the agencies that are involved get enough support to do their work in an independent way. There's more good news. The European Commission has already promised to adopt a new law on transparency in scientific assessments. So we will fight to make sure that our regulators only use public, peer-reviewed studies and that scientists are free from pressure. We can all support independent science by pushing for public funding, particularly for the environment and public health. To achieve all this, we need support from citizens and the scientific community. Ideally, the way it should be done is an agency should get all the information, review that information. The, the industry should do the analyses, but the agencies have to redo those analyses. You can't trust what you get. You must do it yourself. Then they should write their own reviews and make them very much public. And once they're finished, instead of having this internal agency, agency, agency review across all the countries, bring in a scientific board that's external to all of this, that's chosen for merit, people that are well known to work in these fields, and have them review the final decision and the final literature and say, yeah, we like this, or no, you missed this. We also need to prevent further concentration of power and money in the agro-industrial market. We should oppose the murder of Bayer and Monsanto. That is, a, again, a consolidation of two already very big and very powerful companies. There are a number of players in the agricultural world who are very afraid of such a merger. It will make them ever more powerful, and it will make it ever more difficult to fight them on these sort of issues, I suppose. And in the meantime, the truth will continue to come out. Farmers in the USA will see their day in court, and we hope that justice will be done. And so as more and more people and journalists come out and see what's going on, more and more people call up and say, you know, my spouse died of non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, or I have non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, and I use Roundup. So the case is getting bigger and bigger, in fact. It could be the kind of thing that turns into something similar to cigarette litigation in that it's nationwide, worldwide. And if you're wondering what you can do, sign a petition, support a citizen's law initiative, or organize a protest. Pressure your local or regional government to ban or phase out glyphosate. Just spread the word and avoid using glyphosate-based products. One of the biggest things we want out of this court case is for people to know so people know that if they pick up this Roundup, they are risking their lives and they're risking getting non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. We want people to become aware so that they don't have to go through this and so that they don't use Roundup and don't get cancer.